not so long ago, in the not-so-very-distant past, there is an enormous difference in the number of registered organ donors in Holland and Belgium, two ostensibly very similar cultures. What could account for this difference? In one country, almost everyone was registered, and the other, almost no one. It turned out the only difference was in how the proposition had been made to the members of society. In one country, they were asked, would you like to donate your organs? And in the other, are you telling us you don't want to? And on such small things are huge differences made in life. Thus goes tonight's story. Well, my dear friends, we've made it to the middle of the week once again, so it's time for you all to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And listen. Ever gotten the feeling that you exist without really living? That life is no more than an endless, mundane loop of routine that in no way affects the world? Well, that's pretty much all there is to say about myself. I have a dead-end job that keeps me afloat, but I don't have any degrees, any future plans, nor do I have any living relatives. All I have is a single friend, and if I had perished, there wouldn't be anyone to notice my absence from this world. Hopefully, this doesn't sound familiar, but if my situation relates to you even in the slightest, and be wary of what I'm about to tell you, and be careful to whom you put your trust in. His name was John, and for the past year he'd been the only person in my life I could ever call a friend. In fact, from the first day he moved in next door, he emitted an irresistible aura of friendship, and within a week the whole neighbourhood had fallen in love with his presence. I was no exception. After a short conversation with John, I realised that he was a better man than myself in every measurable aspect of life. As self-deprecating as it might sound, I could never live up to his image. He was successful, though I never really understood what kind of job he had. Caring, never shying away from giving anyone in the neighbourhood a helping hand, and on top of it all, he was one hell of a motivational speaker. He could brighten up a room using nothing more than a couple of carefully selected words. Why he decided to befriend me was beyond what I could fathom at the time, but at least once a week we'd get together for a couple of drinks, which he usually paid for, considering my less than ideal financial situation. The last time we'd ever hang out, we just stayed at his place, catching up as usual. He had an early morning and no time to go out, yet he took an hour just to chat with me. You consider yourself a good person? John asked me, as he handed me a freshly opened beer. I hesitated for a moment. I certainly wasn't a bad guy, but I hadn't ever done anything to be better than average. I suppose so, I responded. John smiled for a moment before continuing. So, let's say you were on a sinking ship with ten other people, and you could save them all by jumping off the ship, making it descend into the abyss slower without the extra weight. Would you do it? These were the kinds of philosophical questions John always threw at me, presumably intended to make me think, or so he said. Most people think of themselves as the protagonist of their given story, a hero that would sacrifice themselves if needed. Unfortunately, things don't work like that very often, and we are mostly selfish by nature. I'm not really sure. I guess I would. I asked, rather than stated. Of course, I know you would, but let's take it one step further. What if there was a murderer on board? What do you mean? It will be more beneficial to everyone to sacrifice him instead of yourself. To save everyone else, right? I thought for a moment, but it seemed like an easy enough decision. Sure, I mean, he's already made his choice. He then proceeded to talk about various scenarios of self-sacrifice, which people should be saved and who should perish in bizarre situations. I'm sure only John could have come up with. John always had a point when he started these discussions, but on that particular day he was beating around the bush, and after about 30 minutes I was too curious to hold back. What is this all about? 
I asked. It's about my work, he said as he noticed my beer was getting dangerously close to being empty. Can I get you another? As he left for the kitchen, I thought about John's work. When we first met, he described himself as some sort of consultant or advisor for a private clinic. Admittedly, he'd been vague enough for me to not understand even the tiniest bit of what that meant. My job is basically to save lives, John said, and handed me another open beer. Unfortunately, no matter how hard we try, people die simply because there's not enough time. At that point, I was starting to feel nervous, which I noticed when I found myself subconsciously peeling away the label off my bottle. Every day, 20 people die as they wait for organ donations. That's more than 7,000 people each year that should have survived. Good people that die for no reason other than bad luck. So, um, you work with donors and recipients? I asked, in hopes he'd clarify. Uh, in a manner of speaking, yes. I'm only a scout. Started back when I worked for that godforsaken prison. John had never spoken about his previous jobs, and it came as quite a surprise he'd worked such a low-paying job, for a prison nonetheless. I'd always assumed he'd been born with a silver spoon in his mouth, considering how casual he was with spending money on his friends. The stare of surprise was enough to convey my next question. It wasn't anything special, just a job. I transported prisoners, murderers, rapists, child molesters, you know, the filth of this world. He paused. And that's why I like you, he said. Why? <laughs> because you think I'm a criminal? I laughed nervously. John laughed back. <laughs> of course not. It's because back then, I was just like you. Just like me? What's that supposed to mean? You're a good person with a lot of potential. But you've taken a couple of wrong turns that landed you in a rut. His statement hit home, hard. It was the nicest possible way of calling someone a loser. As a kid, I believed I had a bright future, but with teenage depression setting in during high school, I'd lost myself and kind of fallen into an endless cycle of procrastination and self-destruction. Yeah, the work was awful, and the money was shit. I spent a few years thinking that this would be my future, and to be frank, I thought about cutting my life short a few times. But instead, I was given a second chance. It was starting to feel like John was explaining his origin story, or maybe it was another one of his motivational conversations. A man approached me about the prisoners I transported, told me in specific detail about their crimes, their victims, and so on. He told me there were people in need, and that I could save hundreds of lives. How? Organ. He said casually, like it was the most normal thing in the world. Please don't tell me you're saying what I think you are, I said as I took a large chug of beer to calm myself down. Let's just say I'd rather push the murderer off the sinking ship to save the innocent people. So, um, just so we're on the same page, we're talking about stealing organs. I said, getting more agitated, as I realized he might not be joking. Think of it more as redistributing them to more deserving people. These are monsters that ruin lives, spending their entire existence as nothing more than a plague on society. He sighed before continuing. You said it yourself. You'd rather see them die. Not that ethics was anything I felt qualified about debating, but his words made me feel sick to my stomach. You realize someone's going to notice that the prisoners keep disappearing, I told him. That's what my superiors realized as well. 
Corruption runs deep in the prison system. And though there's no shortage of scum, someone would eventually notice. That's why we had to come up with other means of getting organs. Like what? There are plenty of people in this world that no one would miss. I should know, because I used to be one of them. That was before I got this job. He went on to list any kind of person that he believed weren't worthy of occupying space on this planet. Homeless people, others on welfare, criminals that escape their sentencing, and people like myself, those that spend their lives alone, never impacting anyone enough to be missed. Why are you telling me all of this? I said, shaking from both fear and anger. Because you are on that list, he said, surprisingly somber. What fucking list? The list of people that wouldn't be missed if we took them. I was ready to shoot up from the chair and run for my life, clutching my bottle in case John would physically attack me. They want my organs, I asked, terrified. That's not going to happen, because I won't let it, John said confidently. Despite what my superiors say, I see your potential, and I want you to join our cause. Are you fucking insane? I'm not a murderer. I'm not going to steal people's organs, no matter what kind of sick, twisted moral logic you throw at me. I shouted back at him. Please. You said it yourself. Sacrifice some to save the rest. Not like this. This is the only way I can protect you. If you don't join us, they are going to take you, he said. I don't care. I'm not going to let you do this, I said as I tried to stand up, feeling a bit woozy from the alcohol. John made no attempt at stopping me. Then, I'm sorry, he responded. I took a step away from him before I realized just how dizzy I'd become. The room was practically spinning. Before I knew it, I stumbled and fell. John stood up just in time to break my fall and gently put me back in the recliner. What's happening? I stuttered, the world starting to fade away before my eyes. Thinking back, I realized the beer had been opened before John handed it over to me. I had been drugged. This is not how I wanted it to go. I wanted to save you, but I needed to take precautions. Don't do this, please, I begged. I gave you a choice. And then... Everything turned dark. I slowly awoke and was met by a blinding light hanging above me. Groggy from whatever drug I'd been given, it took a while before I remembered what John had done to me. Oh shit, he's not supposed to be awake, I heard someone say, their voice slightly muffled. Where's the anesthesiologist? God, he doesn't need to be awake for this, another said. A man from what I could tell. I tried to turn around in bed to see who was talking, only to realize I had been restrained. Help! I begged. A woman bent down over me. She seemed genuinely worried. Don't be afraid. Everything will be all right, she said, although unconvincingly. Don't lie to him. Just get the anesthesiologist, the man demanded. The woman stood up and turned away from me. Shut the fuck up, John. Why are you even here? You're not part of the surgical team. He's my friend, he responded. The woman scoffed before storming off. I was becoming more lucid by each passing second as the drug started to wear off. John stood over me with a sad expression on his face. I'm sorry it had to come to this. But I gave you every opportunity to join us. I tried to talk again, but I was still too weak, and the restraints around my chest made it difficult to breathe. 
Just think about the fact your organs will save about eight people. You won't die in vain, and you won't feel a thing. I promise you that much. Fuck you, I managed to force out. John sighed. I could hear light steps, probably the woman returning. But before John could turn to talk to her, she jumped him and plunged a syringe into his neck. What, what the hell are you doing? John asked as he struggled against her. She was only half his size, but fierce, and with the help of whatever she injected into him, she managed to put him down. I gave you a paralytic, John. If you're lucky, someone will be around to help you breathe before it kills you. As soon as John fell to the ground, she came over to free me. I got up slowly, still weak, but she helped me. Thank you, I said. She handed me some surgical scrubs and told me to get dressed. It'll be easier to get out if you blend in, she said. Put on the surgical mask and hairnet as well. We walked casually through the hallways, even passing staff that weren't phased in the slightest by my presence. She led me to the changing room, where we were confronted by a surgeon. Melissa, why aren't you scrubbed in? The donor should be prepped already. I realized they were talking about me. I was supposed to be the donor, but by some miracle, he didn't realize that. A small delay. Ten minutes, all right, she told the surgeon. No one tells me shit around here, he simply scoffed. We entered the changing room where Melissa told me to get dressed. She handed me some casual clothes, and I put them on in a hurry. Why are you helping me? Who are you? I asked. Just get changed. It won't be long before they find John and realize you're missing. Without hesitating, I did as commanded. Melissa quickly led me out of the operating ward before I realized we were actually inside a hospital, one I'd visited before due to a minor fracture. This is just a normal hospital, I asked her. Yes, the perfect disguise, but almost no one knows what's going on in here, not even the employees. We blended in with our surroundings, so getting out was an easy feat. She led me to her car, and we drove away before anyone could realize we were even missing. I relaxed slightly, contemplating my next move. We've got to call the police, I told Melissa. Absolutely not. They've got people all over the place, in every branch of the government. Who are they? Ever wonder why you never hear about rich people dying while stuck on the transplant list? Lack of donors is only applicable for poor people. The rest can pay their way ahead, she explained. So, what do we do now? She shook her head. I don't know. I didn't plan on bringing anyone with me, but bet your ass they'll come after us. We drove in silence for a while out of town. I had so many questions, but in shock I couldn't find the words to coherently ask. All I could do was get out a simple but massive question. Who are you? They call me Melissa, but it's not my real name, but let's just stick with it. She explained how they roped her into the organization. It was a speech just like the one John had told me. Using the worst people mankind had to offer. Steal their organs for innocence. Saving good, deserving lives in the process. In reality, the rich and powerful were the ones to receive the transplants. And the so-called criminals they used were mostly people like myself that wouldn't be missed if they were kidnapped. Nothing I ever do will be enough to forgive my mistakes. But if I'm doomed, at least I want to do something right in my life. She started crying silently, tears rolling down her face in either shame or compassion for the victims. I was thankful for being rescued, but at the same time, I was disgusted by her choice to join them in the first place. 
I just kept my mouth shut. The drugs were still in my system. I could feel it. And as the adrenaline rush from the escape subsided, I eventually drifted off. A dreamless sleep filled with nothing but the thoughts of my past. How the hell I'd fallen this far into depression to the point where I'd become nothing more than the sum of my parts. We're here, Melissa stated, abruptly waking me from my slumber. We were parked outside an apartment complex in a town I had never seen before. It wasn't the most luxurious place in the world, but anything other than a hospital seemed good at that point. Don't worry. I bought this place under a fake name. They shouldn't be able to find us here. The inside of the room was pretty basic. Not much bigger than the average college dorm room, but with a minuscule kitchen and a balcony big enough for two and only one bed. You should get some rest, she said. We're getting out of here tomorrow morning. It didn't take much to convince me. Even though we'd been driving for most of the day, and I'd been resting for half of it, I still felt knocked out. I basically collapsed on the bed, but as tired as I felt, rest wouldn't come easy. I woke up from my restless sleep shortly after, to the sound of Melissa sobbing on the balcony. I barely knew her, but after being betrayed by John, who I believed to be my only friend, I had some sort of attachment to her. Are you alright? I asked. Obviously, she wasn't doing great, but after spending most of my life alone, social awkwardness had become an integral part of my personality. No, I'm not. Oh, this is all too fucked up, she said. I know. I don't even think I'd realized how real this all is. She wiped her eyes. So, how did they get to you? You refused, didn't you? She asked. Yeah. John pretended to be my friend for about a year. Then gave me a speech about saving the innocent. Oh, it's all a bit hazy after the drugs. She looked away, seemingly shameful. I didn't tell them no. Why not? My husband spent over a decade working for the military. Whatever he did for them... It got him sick. Freaking stage four cancer. And we both knew there wasn't any hope left. Maybe a one in a million shot at treatment, but we just couldn't afford it. It would have put us in deep debt, and he refused to die and leave me to deal with it. She looked over to see if I understood. I tried to seem sympathetic, but honestly, I still didn't get how she could sacrifice other people. They promised to help, to cure my husband if I joined them. I'm a surgeon myself, and they needed more people with experience. You still should have said no, I responded foolishly. She chuckled. <laughs> You've never been in love, have you? I didn't have a long record of relationships, though I had tried a couple at least, but love wasn't anything I'd had much experience with. Thought not. So, what happened to your husband? Did they save him? Of course not. There's no guaranteed cure for cancer. He died in agony, never knowing what I did to attempt to save him. He didn't deserve that. It should have been me. I didn't say much after that. Couldn't find the words. I simply stood by her side and listened to whatever story she had to tell. Hours passed, and the sun started to rise once again, neither of us getting a lick of sleep. Just as the sun peeked over the horizon, the silent neighborhood was rudely awakened by the sound of sirens in the distance. Within seconds, two police cars had pulled up in front of the building. Wait, they're not here for us, are they? I asked. Four policemen stepped out from the vehicles, followed by... A civilian. It was John. There's somewhere in this building, one of them shouted. Melissa and I looked at each other in shock. She only said three words. Fire escape, now! How the hell did they find us this quickly? 
I asked. We spurred it down the fire escape that led down the back of the building, just out of sight from the police. I don't know. Do you want to stop and ask? Melissa yelled sarcastically back at me. Melissa was in far better shape than myself, and spurred it down the stairs while I more or less stumbled. It led to a back alley and back to the main road. I peeked around the corner to see a couple of officers standing by our car. Damn. What now? I asked. I'll call my contact. Maybe he can help. Who? The only other guy that ever got out from under their grip. Once we got onto a more populated street with people commuting to work by bus, we calmed down and tried to seem normal. We took the bus to no specific location, just attempting to put some distance between ourselves and John. As we stepped off the bus, Melissa pulled out a phone and dialed a number. Charlie, I need help, she said while looking around for a street sign. She read the name for her contact and then hung up the phone. Oh, there's a diner around the corner, apparently. We'll wait for him there, Melissa said. The diner was the most cliched kind of roadside cafe that could ever have existed, seemingly taken straight out of the fifties. Within a minute of entering, a waitress came up to take our order. Just coffee, please, Melissa said. I ordered the same. After ten minutes, a man entered the diner. Late forties, but with an impressive white beard that made him seem much older. You still go by Melissa? he said. Yeah, Charlie, at least for now. He looked at me, judging my presence. Who is this? And why is he here? He's one of the donors, she responded. Yeah, well, I ain't getting him out of here as well. I only had papers for you, and you're supposed to have left already. I couldn't let them do it again, Melissa responded. The man sighed and waved the waitress over. You got any whiskey? he asked. The waitress nodded and left again without questioning his decision to drink at six in the morning. While we waited for our order, Melissa explained the situation to Charles. He listened patiently without interrupting, only sighing here and there as she got to the part about rescuing me. This John guy, he's an advisor which is bad news for you both, he said. How so? I asked. The advisors are put in charge of finding donors, such as yourself, which is all fine and dandy as long as everything goes smoothly. Basically, they lose any of their subjects, and they get executed by the superiors. Isn't that good for us? Sure. Except it means he'll do anything in his power to find you two suckers. As he finished that sentence, our order arrived. Charles immediately chugged down his whiskey and gestured to the waitress for another. What are we supposed to do then? Well, if you're lucky, the system is still fragmented, meaning only the advisors know the personal information of the donors. And should they get captured or whatever, the information they can provide is limited. It also means that if they die, what they know dies with them. I stared expectantly at him, waiting for him to continue. It's simple. You've just got to kill John. Oh, so that's all we've got to do, I asked, annoyed. Listen, Charles, what about some papers? You already have yours. As far as your friend's concerned, if John is gone and no one finds out where he stores his information, it shouldn't be a problem. Everyone at the clinic is put under anonymous identities. Even if the superior did know about your friend here, they wouldn't risk hunting him down. As long as John's dead. He directed his gaze towards me. Kill John and get the fuck out of town in case it pisses anyone off. Charles received his second whiskey and chugged that too, before storming out of the diner. Any ideas? Melissa asked me. Yeah, I'm going to call John, set up a meeting, 
record it and send it to you, I responded. That sounds really fucking stupid. You got a better idea, I asked, gesturing for a phone. His number was quite an easy one to remember, and seeing as he'd be my only friend, I'd memorized it by chance. The phone rang once. It rang twice. Click. Well, this is the last thing I expected, John said as he picked up the phone. Hello, John. I hear you've been looking for me, I said, trying to sound as confident as possible. You're right about that. You left me in a bit of a pickle. Well, you did try to steal my organs. I gave you a job offer, if you recall, he shot back. I hesitated for a moment. I oh, know, um, about that offer. I paused. You saying you've changed your mind? Um, yeah. I guess I am. What about Melissa? John asked. That's the woman that released me. She ran. Left me to my own devices after we got out of town. Don't know where she is. I lied. Better than expected. Fair enough. Where do we meet? My place. Five o'clock. I hung up after that, and Melissa looked at me with a confused look on her face. You know he's going to kill you, right? Probably. But before that, I might at least get enough of a confession for you to shut them down. I held up the phone she'd given me. Okay, I'll call you before I go in, and you can recall the conversation. And what if he shoots you in the face without saying a word? Then... I guess this was all for nothing, I responded. We found a local place to rent a car. Melissa risked using her new identification. The drive was long, and the weather was depressing. The clock ticking down towards a meeting with an old friend. Nothing I dreaded more in the world than coming face to face with the man who betrayed me. We've got to make a pit stop. I have a friend that lives here. We stopped by a small, run-down house. Melissa was only gone for a couple of minutes, but when she returned, she held a paper bag. You want to borrow this for your meeting with John? She asked as she pulled out a gun. Holy shit, I can't use that, I said. Well, I'm not going down without a fight if they find me. We pulled up a few blocks from my apartment. Wouldn't risk getting too close. Melissa offered her gun once again, but I refused. Killing John wouldn't end the horror, but maybe exposing him would at least let the world know the atrocities that were going on in the dark. Thank you for this, I said. Try not to get killed, Melissa responded before shutting the door and driving off. The three blocks I had to walk to my apartment felt like miles. Every second I had to fight an urge to run, but I knew if I didn't face my predator, he'd never stop hunting me. John was already waiting for me outside, accompanied by two of the officers I'd seen earlier. Hello, John. Hello, old friend. Shall we go inside? He asked in a friendly but fake voice. As we entered the building, I clicked to call Melissa. My phone set to silent, of course. And they didn't care to check for a phone or weapon. I guess he felt safe enough while surrounded by police. No sooner had we gone inside before one of the cops pulled his weapon on me. I'm not an idiot, John said, before he gestured to the other cop to pat me down. He took out my phone and ripped out the battery. I guess Melissa isn't so far away after all. You wanted some confession, he asked. I didn't respond. Let's make this easy. Drink this bottle of water. It contains a mild sedative. Won't knock you out, but you'll be more compliant. We still have several clients waiting for your parts. At first, I refused. 
But then John gave me a punch to the guts, and I fell to the floor. I could just sedate you again, but it looks more suspicious. And it's not good for your liver. Whatever you prefer. When he offered me the cocktail of drugs once again, I drank it voluntarily. It hit me immediately, somehow taking away my ability to properly refuse any request. Let's go, he told the officers, before they led me out of there. I really did appreciate your friendship, he said as we left the building and headed for his car. But they'd kill me if I let you go now. I mumbled something back, not even sure what I said. What? Before John could finish that sentence, he was shot square in his forehead. And within a split second, all three of my captors had been shot. John and one officer in the head, the last in the neck. The latter laid on the ground clutching his neck, quickly bleeding out. Melissa ran up and quickly finished the last one off. You're a fucking moron. You know that, she said. How... I stuttered. My husband was in the military, remember? Taught me all there is to know about firearms. Figured it would be nice to be able to defend myself while he was off fighting wars. She dragged me to the car and threw me in the seat. I couldn't resist, but I was once again drugged and rescued. While you were busy getting yourself killed, I snuck into your friend John's house and just took every laptop and hard drive I could find. <laughs> Figured he'd be too busy with you to notice. You could have told me that was your plan, I mumbled. Well, I improvised, she stated. We're in deep shit now, but at least we've got something to show for it. Well, as of this moment, we are on the run. The way it went down with John... The police officers made me believe we'd be chased down immediately. But after a week of running, not a single headline in any newspaper talks about what happened. My best guess is that whoever John worked for swept it under the rug. So at least I'm not wanted. The hard drive contained information about 16 living patients and 154 deceased ones, all donors. Unfortunately... There's no location information about the living ones. John is dead. And alongside him, well, a few lives might have been saved, but I'm afraid the organization is still out there looking for new victims. There's no sure way of beating them. Their roots run too deep. All you can do is to be the best version of yourself and hope they never find you. Good luck. Well, 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 another fantastic one there from Dr. Creepin's Vault. The subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. That was another one from Richard Saxon, who is fast becoming one of my favourite authors. Real pleasure reading all of his work. Did you enjoy it? Thoughts, feelings in the comments section below and I'll do my best as ever to join in the chat. Well, that's enough for me for one night. I, of course, will be back on Friday. Does anyone fancy the sequel to Werewolves or Assholes? You do? Well, be sure to let me know in the comments section. Maybe I'll do that on Friday. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay?